Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome back. We're going to do another Bible If uh, for the book of Matthew. We're in part 6. So if you turn to Matthew 12, 1, we'll get started on some more Bible Ifs. Remember, Bible Ifs in the Bible, they're, um, they're a condition. If this, then this applies. If this is in place, then this is in place. And people try to ignore the first part and try to grab the second part. And they ignore the condition. And we want to do a Bible list for instruction and righteousness. Sometimes the Bible lists are for us. Sometimes we're just going over to show what's going on in that time period when Jesus was in his earthly ministry and show how it's kind of happening today. Okay. Here's a good one. Turn to Matthew 12, 1. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of the corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was a hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat of the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read the law, how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Jesus taught about himself. Verse 7. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not have condemned the guiltless. There's the if. If you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. They were, guilt they were not guilty. Okay. Turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. What's going on here? God manifests in the flesh. God the Father manifests in the flesh. Jesus Christ okay, is walking among them. And they don't see him as God. Right. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. Verse 21 Because that, when they knew God, Jesus was right there. What did he say? But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. He said that in this place is greater, one greater than the temple. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. But became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now the first thing I want to talk about is, real quick, on the word fool. I've heard comments, people saying you shouldn't call people fool. But my biggest thing is you need to understand the distinction between foolish and fool when you're reading the King James Bible. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay? The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Jesus is walking right before them, and they're not looking at him as God. They're not treating him as God. They're trying to find all these faults with him, the people that follow him. Anything they can possibly do to tear him down. Oh, he's just a sinner. And we're going to get to some of that. Oh, he's just a sinner, just like you and me. Okay. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right. Now, the Bible and other passages, it talks about being foolish. Okay, where it says their foolish heart was darkened. Foolish, when you read it, when it applies to today, be careful. There's nothing wrong with me calling someone foolish. What am I saying? If I see someone who professes to be saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing, they profess this, but I see something, not something quite right with their life, that they're living for the Lord. You can say that you're acting foolish. What does that mean? You're acting like a lost person. When you say foolish, you're acting like someone who's lost. You might not be lost, but you're either looking like someone who's lost or you're acting like someone who's lost. So be careful. It's okay to say foolish. You're being 
foolish to a brother or sister in Christ. You're being foolish. In other words, you're starting to go the way of the world. You're starting to look like the world. You're starting to act like the world. Okay. You're starting to turn your back on some of the stands you once took. You're starting to go the way of the world. But to call someone a fool, you better be sure that they're lost. Don't get me wrong. If someone comes to me with a different plan of salvation than that's found in the King James Bible, they're a fool. But I don't call them a fool on the spot. I try to show them the truth. Okay, the Bible teaches that it's through faith that we find God's grace. And that faith that it's talking about is faith in repentance. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Faith in confessing both in prayer. Faith in asking God to save you. Lord, I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it with my belief. I didn't earn it with my repentance. I didn't earn it with my confession. Confessing both of those in prayer. Lord, save me. Asking God to save you. Okay? I, there's some things that you look at people and say, okay, they turn their back on the truth. You've tried witnessing to them. They don't want to hear the truth. Now you can say they're a fool. Okay? They don't want the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. A fool said in his heart, there is no capital G God. Okay? There's a lot of people that say Jesus is not the fa God the Father. The only capital G God in this book is God the Father. If you don't believe Jesus and God the Father are one and the same, then you don't believe Jesus is the God of this book, capital G God. It's just that simple. So I wanted to point that out there that people are kind of getting in arguments, but be careful. I'm just trying to help clarify. Foolish is okay to use. The Bible talks about in Matthew, um, I can't remember if it's chapter 5, but it talks about how you're supposed to, between before one or two witnesses, you go to a brother who's doing something wrong, and if he didn't... They, he won't listen to you. You go to the, you take the church to him and say, "Hey, maybe he'll listen to the church." If he refuses to listen to the church, he's to be as a heathen and a publican. There's justification to break fellowship with brethren, and they're to be treated as if they're lost. Okay, they might be saved, but according to this book, they're to be a, as a heathen and a publican. The Bible also says, I forgot the, I'm bad with addresses sometimes, but it says somewhere else in the Bible. It's not in my notes about how you give them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. If they're going to start acting foolish and looking like the lost world and acting like a lost person, you give them over to the world. Who's the lowercase g god of this world? Satan. You give them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his soul may be saved. Okay? That somewhere he would become broken and realize, I've fallen away. I've pushed all my brothers and sisters away. Okay. So, these guys here, back to, the, to what we're talking about in Matthew 12, 1. These guys were fools. They didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was. Okay, the Jesus of the King James Bible. Didn't believe who he said he was. Okay. Turn to John 12, 42. And that's the if there. If they had known what this meaneth, if they would believe that Jesus is who he is, they would have been questioning his disciples. Why are you doing this? Well, God himself is there. He's okay with it. Why am I even saying anything about it? All right. John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believe on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Why am I reading this? Remember the part that we read up there. It says in Matthew 12, 7, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. Okay? The apostles weren't in sin. Right. But I read that because we're going to read another story about how they condemned the guiltless. Even by their own standards, they went against their own standards. Remember what it says there. They would not confess him. Confession comes from the heart, not the head. There's a lot of people that will say stuff that come from up here, but it's not a heartfelt confession. True biblical confession comes from the heart. They would not confess him here. Why? Because they would have been put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men 
more than the praise of God. Turn to John 9, 1. We're going to read a long story, but it's a good story. It's a really good story. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Who's doing the work? Jesus is, but it's the work of God. God manifests in the flesh. Verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pools of Siloam, which is to be interpreted sent. He went this way, Therefore, and washed and came seeing. Jesus healed the man. And if you follow prophecy, it's prophecy that he's going to heal people. Even people that were born blind are going to be able to see through him. Verse 8. The neighborhood, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, It's not, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Yeah. I want to stop there for a second. Brothers, sisters, Christ, this is a good example of someone who's born again. There's a difference. People are like, uh, Is that really him? We are born in a world spiritually blind. I was born blind, brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritually speaking. I was born blind. It took Jesus opening, knocking at the door and opening, and me opening the door and letting him in, and he opened my eyes. He helped me to see. And you're going to get that reaction if you're newly saved. It maybe it hasn't happened hardcore yet, but you're going to get that reaction from people. Is that the same person? Do, do we really know you? I don't think I even know you anymore. How many times have you heard that statement? I don't think I know you anymore. All right. You're going to get that. And those that's been saved for a while have been through it where they're like, uh, yeah, people said that God changed me. There was a physical change in my life. I stopped doing a lot of bad things. God cl started cleaning up my life. I got a lot of things out. There was a difference in me. Him, there was a physical dis difference in him. He's walking around like everybody else is. He can see. He's not stumbling around. He's not using a stick to see. He's not sitting there begging as a blind man anymore. Is this the same man? There's a difference. There's a change. And he said, I am he. Verse 10. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? How many happened? Well, what happened to you? What, what caused this change in your life? Verse 11. He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. How many times have you told your testimony to loved ones, to family members, how God saved you? What was the reaction? Especially if they were professing Christians and, oh, you, you got saved the way I did. You were always saved. They don't want to believe that you got truly saved and born again, that you were a false convert. Because if they have to accept that you were a false convert, they might have to accept that they were a false convert too, or are, present tense, a false convert. Verse 12, Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. Verse 13, They brought him to the Pharisees, I'm sorry, They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind, the religious leaders of the day. 14, And it was the Sabbath day when the Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. How many times have you had to repeat your testimony to people? They just don't believe it. I know. But God saved me. He's changed my life. 
I found out the Bible version issue. You want to hear about the Bible version issue? No, they don't want to hear about it. I got the true plan of salvation found in the King James Bible. They don't want to hear that either. And they keep asking you, what happened to you? What happened to you? No matter how many times you tell them what happened to you, they're going to keep asking, what happened to you? Verse 16, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. I want to stop there to make a very important point. Those of us who've come out of the Babel building system, the organized religion, or you've come out of false religions, you know, cults and whatnot, one thing you realize, it's in all of them, no matter what, it's in all of them, there's always division among them. They're always fighting and scrambling for power. Who's right, who's wrong, because everything's built on the standard of man. And man is always flawed, and they'll always be wrong. Okay, they're flawed. I am a sinner saved by grace. But before I was saved, I'm a sinner that's on my way to hell. Okay, I had no idea what the truth was. God had to open my eyes. It takes God to open your eyes. But you'll see, we can testify those that came out of the Bible building system. The uh, church building that I grew up in, uh, it split two or three times. And there was always division. There's always fighting going on in the mix of it, especially with the people in charge, the elders or whoever was really the people that wanted the power and the money. Right? There's always division among them. Why is that? Because it's not of God. The Bible teaches us time and time again we're supposed to be of one mind. One body, one mind. We're all supposed to be walking together, not contrary to one another. Not strife. Okay. Paul talks about that, where he sees that in some of the uh, Corinthians and the Galatians and so forth. That there's strife among you. There's contention among you. You're supposed to be walking as one. Okay. Verse 17, I just wanted to point that out. You always find division in false in the religious leaders of the day. Organized religion. Okay. Verse 17, They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He said, Listen to what he says. He says it is a prophet. He is a prophet. Now, did he, did he confess that Jesus is Christ? We're going to get to that part where the parents won't because they get put out of the synagogue if they confess that Jesus is Christ. He has said he's a prophet. 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. So, they asked the man multiple times. He told him this testimony. Jesus healed me and opened my eyes. And they still didn't believe him. So then they called his parents. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind, and how then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. A witness, two witnesses. Remember what the Bible says, before two or three witnesses, let every word be established? You have two witnesses, parents, they're saying, yeah, this is our son. And yes, he was born blind. 21, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or what hath opened his eyes, we know not. They didn't even believe their son. Why? He's of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. Why they say this? Verse 22, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Would we just read back there? There's men that uh, would not confess Jesus Christ. They believed in him up here, but they would not confess him down here. Why? Because they get kicked out. And they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. These parents love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They wouldn't stand by their son. I trust my son. If he said this is what happened, that's what happened. They wouldn't do that. Okay? They basically left him to defend himself. 23. Therefore he said his parents, he is of age, ask him. 24. Okay, okay, okay. He was, he was born blind. We got two witnesses. So now we're going to go back to the, back to the blind man. 
Then again called they the man that was blind, and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Talking about Jesus Christ. They're always trying to push this. 25. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. He's not claiming he's sinless. He's not claiming he's a sinner. I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. He's just testifying to the truth. I was blind, and now I see. Verse 26. Then said they to him again, What did he to, to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He's already explained it multiple times. How many times have you explained your testimony multiple times to the same person? He answered them, I have told you already, and yet did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Remember, he said he's a, a prophet. 28. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Remember what we just read there in Matthew? But if he had known what this meaneth, that the, this place is great, one greater than the temple, but if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. What could they do to this guy? They say, we know what, where, from whence he is. Verse 30, The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. You get so happy, it's a great thing to get saved and born again. But the world can really tear down that joy and try to steal that joy from you when you're trying to witness and testify to family members and friends, people that know you, that knew you when you were lost, especially is what I'm trying to say. All right. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. You read the Old Testament. What it is is anybody that holds iniquity in their heart, God will not hear. And that most people back then were very wicked. That's why Jesus came back to try to save his people, the Jewish people. All right. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Oh. I will not hold iniquity in my heart. If I hold iniquity in my heart, uh, uh, King David saying in the Psalms, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. What does he read? But if a man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. He's saying he's a prophet. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? Wait a minute. He's born in sins. What about the Pharisees? Oh, we're, we're, we're not born in sins. We're, we're better than everybody. We're better than the laity. But they throw that back in his face. How many times have you had people throw that in your face? Well, you're just a sinner like me. You're just a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. You keep reading that, Jesus comes to him, talks to him, and explains to him who he is. But what happened? They cast him out. They condemned the guiltless. How often does that happen today? You get saved, you get born again in these organized religion, in these Babel buildings, and you start saying, well, but the Word of God says this, but the Word of God says this. And they have that attitude. You that were born in sins doth teach me. <laughs> you know, that whole attitude. And you get what happens. You get cast out. But I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just standing for the word of God. It's going to happen to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. It happened to Jesus Christ himself. It happened to people that stood there. And even someone as innocent as the man that was born blind. To say, hey, he, he's a prophet. He didn't say he's the son of God. God manifest in the flesh. He didn't say he's the Christ. He just said he's a prophet. He worships God. He does his will. He, he hears. So God hears him. Okay? What's the big deal? Why are you guys acting this way? To the Pharisees. Like he's acting like, why are you guys acting this way? They're condemning the guiltless. And it's still going on today. 
Okay? There's people today in organized religion who profess to know Jesus Christ, but they don't. Okay? John 7.21 says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay? We are to judge. Don't get me wrong. But you're going to get, see those uh, organized religion more than anything, where they condemn the guiltless. Big time. Okay? The Bible if there, if they had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. It's God manifest in the flesh. Okay? Lord of the Sabbath. But they didn't treat him as such. And ever since I got saved and born again, and God started opening my eyes with his word, and started changing my life, I start looking at all this organized religion and see how just ridiculous it is. Satanic, wicked, all that's there, but how they're always fighting amongst themselves. How they're hypocrites. That's the biggest thing. They're hypocrites. We're going to get to another passage. They're hypocrites. And God opened my eyes and said, you're not supposed to be like that. Be separate. Right. Turn to Matthew 12, 9. Let's go to the next Bible if. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. Yeah. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? So they're trying to get him right away. You know, we just did 12.1 through 8. And now we're on 12.9. Yeah. That they might accuse him. They're trying to set him up. Verse 11, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? He's calling them out. If this happened, which it probably did lots of times, if this happened, you'd do this. And they did. There's a condition. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then see, said he to the man, Stretch forth thy, thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. But here's the thing, he's calling them out, Don't be hypocrites. Would you not do a good thing on a Sabbath day? Oh yeah, oh yeah, we do a good thing. Then I should be able to do a good thing. Don't be a hypocrite. But look at 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him how they might destroy him. Remember earlier, they're condemning the guiltless. Who's the most guiltless man ever? Jesus Christ. No sin in him. He became sin who knew no sin. He was sinless. He was guiltless through and through. And they're seeking to destroy him how they might destroy him. Turn to Matthew 7, 1. It says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Okay. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. This is talking about hypocritical judgment. It's not saying you can't judge, period. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Time and time again, Paul tells us about false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing. They'll be known by their fruits. There's judgment that has to be done. But what we're talking about here is it's saying, For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Be careful that you're doing the same standard and not being a hypocrite. If I say that video games are bad, and they are, and they're sinful, and they're wicked, and they are, and yet, I'm playing video games, and it's okay for me, but it's not okay for you. That makes me a hypocrite. I'm not judging myself on the same standard that I'm judging you by. That's why we keep reading. It says, And behold thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. That's thou hypocrite. That's hypocrisy. 
First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of the brother's eye. There's the judgment. Judge yourself first. Make sure you get it out of your own eye. The beam that's out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly to take the mote out of thy brother's eye. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when you go to judge a brother or sister in Christ, make sure you judge yourself first. The Bible says judgment must first begin at the house of God. Okay, and I've always taught this, the house of God. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. Then there's the body of Christ as a whole. Judgment starts here with me first. Then it goes to the brothers and sisters in Christ. And then when it goes to the lost world, it's to let them know that they're sinners on their way to hell. They have a sickness, they have a disease, and Jesus is the only cure. His blood is the only cure. Okay? That's the way it goes. Okay? When you go to judge somebody on anything, always look at yourself first and say, Hey, Lord, do I have a problem with this? Lord, do I need to work harder on this? Okay. Because you, you can struggle with the same sin that, that, that you're going to correct that brother on. You can struggle with it. But your heartfelt attitude is, is, it's wrong. I shouldn't be doing it. I've gotten it out of my life. The temptation keeps coming in. I start singing hymns. I start reciting Bible verses. I do Bible studies. I go for walks and pray for hours on end because this temptation just comes in. You can have that there and still be able to correct a brother in Christ. This hypocritical judgment is when you're doing it and saying it's nothing wrong with you doing it. It's just wrong if anybody else does it. You'll find that a lot in organized religion. They will go against their own laws, their own regulation, their own rules. Mm -hmm. They're hypocrites. Matthew chapter 15, verse five, 7. Turn to Matthew 15, 7. Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Remember, true confession comes from the heart. Anybody can say anything. It says Satan is the father of lies. You're of your father the devil, okay, to the lost world that just enjoy lying. Anybody can say anything. True confession comes from the heart. It says here, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrines and the commandments of men. There's that big fight and strife going on because everyone's trying to str struggle for power so they can have their standards, man's standards, but their standards to be the final standards. Everyone's struggling to be the final authority. They don't want God being the final authority. Mm -hmm. And we see what's going on there. They're being hypocrites. They're always trying to find fault with Jesus to say he's a sinner like one of us. But the standards that they're trying to hold Jesus to, they're not holding themselves to at first. They're not checking themselves first. Remember what they said to the blind man? You were born in sin, dost thou teach us? In other words, what are they saying? I'm sinless without actually coming out and saying, I'm sinless. They're basically saying they're sinless. Who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to teach me? Mm -hmm. So that Bible lift is talking about hypocritical judgment. And do we see that today? All the time in these organized religion. All the time. Right now in our own government we see it. They lay down laws and rules and regulations that man, uh, the citizens of this United States, is supposed to follow, and yet our government doesn't follow them. They break them left and right. They do whatever they want. Okay? There's a lot of hypocrisy going around today, but in the life of a Christian, you're supposed to make sure there's no hypocrisy in you. You're supposed to reflect Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be a light to the world. Check yourself first before you judge somebody else. And be careful not to judge physically. I always tell people, get, before we get to the next, the next one, when you see someone who's physically messed up, talk with them. Talk to them with love. Talk to them, you know, with truth. Absolute truth. But talk with them. They might be newly saved. Okay? The only time that the outward appearance, when you're looking at the outward appearance, reflects the inward appearance is when you're talking to someone, oh yeah, I've been saved for 20 years, 
but they're physically on the outside, they look like the world, they act like the world, they laugh at the world's jokes. There's no change life. Their ad toward to us, this book is bad. The King James Bible is God's perfect written word in English. And you look at them and it's like, you're not really judging on the outside. It's just the outside is what got you to come closer to say, hey, how are you doing? How is your walk with the Lord? And you look on the inside and you realize something's not right. Spiritually speaking, something's not right. But remember, be careful. Judge yourself first. Don't be quick to judge physically. Someone could be newly saved. When I was newly saved, I was a mess. God had a lot to work on to clean my life up. Someone might be newly saved. You don't know. But my thing is, I always throw that in there. I have no problem telling someone they're lost. When I looked at the outside and I came to a closer look and started talking to them about God's word and about the things in their life, is God getting this out? You know what God says about this? You know what God says about that? You know, how are you doing here? You know, you know come on, you got to stand firm. You know, encourage them a little bit. But you get to them and they're like, who are you? Get away from me. I have no problem with the way I'm living. I love the way I'm living. I've been saved for 20 years. Who are you to talk? You were born in sin. Who are you to teach me? <laughs> Like we just read there. That's their attitude. Then you're looking more on the spiritual side. It's like something ain't right. But the Bible warns us to be careful when it comes to physical judgment. Yeah. Turn to Matthew 12, 22. Another Bible if that we're coming across. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Remember what we talked about earlier, about how in organized religion, they're always feuding and fighting. They're always breaking. The battle buildings I went to, they split off. One group went over here, one group went over there. And you always have having splits. They're always fighting. Right? Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. What, what are we commanded to do, brothers and sisters of Christ? We're commanded to stand in this evil day. We're supposed to be of one mind, one body. We're supposed to be walking together. We're supposed to be standing. But when you've got people that try to sneak in and they try to get you to fall, what does that do? That hurts the body of Christ. Verse 26. And if, if here's the Bible, if, and if Satan cast out Satan, that's the condition, here's the result. He, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, there's the condition, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. The gospel when Jesus was physically walking on, the world, on this earth was not death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, he foretold it, but the gospel is the kingdom of God, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. He came as their king to bring in the, what we call the millennial kingdom, and it only means a thousand years. Jesus was coming to rule as their king for a thousand years. But if I cast out the Spirit of God, by, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Now you keep reading, it goes into the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. I'll go over that just real quick. The only way that the Holy Ghost can be blasphemed is when Jesus is physically present. That's why he said it will not be forgiven in this time and in the time to come. The thousand year reign. Jesus will be ruling the reign for a thousand years. That hasn't happened yet. We have to go through the catching away of the body of Christ. The seven years of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. And then Jesus comes back, wipes out, I think it's the 200 men. Sometimes I get the numbers wrong. 200 million man army. And sets up his kingdom and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And that time period, if anybody calls him Satan, it's not the Holy Spirit that's in him, it's a devil that's in him. Or when he's physically present right then and there, 
that won't be forgiven. That's how you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Now, one thing I put in my notes, though, is honestly, this is you can still get saved. You can still repent. God will forgive you. But the closest thing you can come to blaspheming the Holy Ghost today is the Trinity. Okay? The Trinity, all these false Jesuses out there, the Bible talks about Antichrist. There will be many Antichrists out there. you got a lot of people saying, I'm worshiping Jesus Christ, but you look at who they're worshiping, and it's Satan. Beelzebub. The God of the Trinity is Satan. Okay? Now, I don't want to go into it too much, but you go in the Old Testament. I love that story. A brother in Christ brought it up. In the Old Testament, you had Aaron with Moses, where Moses is up in the mountain for 40 days. Okay? He comes down and finds what? Everybody's naked, dancing and worshiping a calf, a golden calf, singular. And Aaron, when he made it, he said, O Israel, this be thy gods, plural, that brought you out of Egypt. But it's one, stat, one, one calf, one statue, one idol. One God, yet it's God's plural that brought you out of Egypt. It's always been pagan. The Trinity has always been pagan from day one. Okay, I serve one God, capital G God, and that God is Jesus Christ. Godhead, body, soul, and spirit. Body. Um, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body. Okay, I had a brother correct me on that. Spirit starts first, then soul, then body. But you have Holy Spirit, which is the spirit. You have God the Father, which is the soul. And you have Jesus Christ, which is the body. They are one. There's one person in the Godhead. The Trinity teaches God in three persons. The Bible, the King James Bible, teaches the Godhead, not Trinity. Godhead is God in one person and that person is Jesus Christ. But the biggest thing about blaspheming the Holy Ghost, I'm not saying that's truly blasphemy that you can't be forgiven. Like I said, it's only when Jesus is physically present on this world. But the closest you can get is worshiping Satan and claim you're worshiping Jesus Christ. That's total blasphemy. And how often does it go on today? We see it all around us. All these false organized religion. I told you um, one of the old studies, I don't have the notes on me, but one of my old studies I did, we were looking online and we we're looking at what the lost world says. Not my opinions and feelings. They did the tally, and I understand it's not 100% correct because they haven't gotten everybody. You can't reach everybody. But close to half the world's population believed in a Jesus Christ. Just like that blind man, there's some people that believe Jesus Christ is real. He truly existed. He's just a prophet. Some people believe he's brother. Uh, uh, he's a brother of Satan. He's a crazed being. I think that's the Mormons. Right. Jehovah's Witness. He's Archangel Gabriel, manifest in the flesh. I think it's Gabriel. Like I said, sometimes I get it's Arch uh, Gabriel or it's another angel. But they think he's just an angel manifest in the flesh. Okay, that's Satanism. Now you can still be forgiven in this time because Jesus is not physically present. Jesus is in heaven preparing a home for us. He's preparing a place for us. The body's in heaven. He's left his Holy Spirit in us. That's why, because all three are one, I can say I have Jesus in me. He's a light to the world. I'm trying to shine my light to the world. I have the Holy Spirit in me, but because I believe in the true Godhead, without being a hypocrite, I can say Jesus is in me, and I need to let Jesus shine through me. Trinity people can't. They're not one and the same. They're their own gods. Three lower gods that make up one big god. It's a whole other thing. But I wanted to point that out that what God was putting out in my heart said, do you know the biggest thing that's close? It's not there. You can still get forgiven, but the closest thing is the Trinity is a big one. But all these false Jesuses out there, deceiving people into believing that they're Christians and they can have this world. And, they, and it's Satan posing as a Jesus Christ, saying, come worship me, and I'll give you the world. The same thing he tried to offer Jesus Christ himself when he walked on this earth. Worship me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. I'll give you the world. He's doing that to people today, and they're falling for it left and right. And then we come to him with the real Jesus Christ, and they, most of the time, 
especially in these last days, they don't want to listen. They don't want anything to do with the real Jesus Christ. Turn to Romans 1.21. We're going to read this again. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. God manifest in the flesh is right there in front of them, and they're saying He has a devil in them. He's Satan. You know, He works for Satan. Verse 23. And that's the biggest thing you're going to get from Satanists. They really try to push the world. Look at them. They're Satanists. We're the Satanists, not them. We show from Scripture that they're not following Scripture. They're not obeying by God's Word. And they're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're servants of Satan. But they'll come around hardcore with, you're the Satanist. No, you're the Satanist. And they can't prove it through Scripture. It's based off their feelings and opinions. It's based off of traditions of men, man's standards philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world, after traditions of men, and not after Christ. We read in the Bible. Verse 23, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Okay. 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. They have to. Trinity, capital T, Trinity is a title for God. Where is it in Scripture? Not in there. All right. Yet, they'll turn the truth of God into a lie. I even posted a video, thanks to a brother in Christ, Brother Alex. He sent me this, and I put that posted that video of the man that was coming out in these Baptist Babel buildings. This man is a total Satanist, through and through. He comes out and he downplays Godhead as a title for God. No, it's just a description for Jesus Christ saying that he has the qualities of God. Godhead has nothing to do with the Trinity. The Trinity is something separate, and you need to believe in the Trinity. He basically did away with the Godhead, away with the Scriptures, and go off of paganism and man's words. Always told people, this always gets me irritated because these people are deceiving people left and right. It starts out with, I believe the Godhead. Then they start bringing in the Trinity and say, oh, I believe the Godhead. But sometimes, just sometimes, it can be called Trinity. And then after a while, it's Godhead or Trinity equally. They, call, they use Trinity as much as they use Godhead. Then they go to using Trinity most of the time and rarely use Godhead. It might be Godhead. You know, also known, could be called Godhead. Then it becomes 100% Trinity and they do away with the Godhead completely. And that's what's going on today. It's exactly what's going on today. And the only people that are still using Godhead who are hardcore Trinitarians are the ones that are still trying to deceive people by saying, I'm a Bible believer. Well, it says Godhead in here and I, if I deny that, I'm going to lose followers. They're really going to see through me then. So they'll say, oh, well, also known as the Godhead. But they don't believe it for one second. They just believe in their pagan trinity, not the Godhead of the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. They change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It's a great example of the Trinity believers. I had to put that down in my notes. This is a great example. Who change the truth of God into a lie. And they do. And they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Remember, I, I might have this verse down. We might read it again. But it just comes to my mind where it talks about how whose God is their belly. And whose glory is their shame. Who mind earthly things. Romans chapter 8 talks about being carnally minded and walking after the flesh. They serve the creature, the flesh, more than the creator, Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever. Amen. This is a perfect example of those Trinitarians and all these people that worship these false Jesus. It's all about so you can have the flesh, you can have the world. The way of the world is sin. The way of the world is contrary to the scriptures. It's everything they, do, they can do to defile God, dishonor God, and be an abomination in his sight. 
but they still call themselves Christians. Yeah, it's pretty bad out there, brothers and sisters of Christ. But that's a great example of Trinity believer. Okay, Acts five, turn to Acts five twenty seven. Remember, they're calling Jesus Satan. They don't want to believe he's God manifest in the flesh, that his authority surpasses their own. So he's he's a Satanist. What did I say? Acts five twenty seven. Went too far. Verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set him them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, think about how they're saying it. They're condemning themselves. You're going to bring this blood upon us. Some people will grab that and say, well, that's because they were responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. Yes, that's there. But they're trying to bring Jesus to them and let his blood cleanse them from all unrighteousness. They're preaching the plan of salvation to them. See how they're condemning themselves? You're trying to bring this man's blood upon us. Amen. You need that blood. You have a sickness. You have a disease. And the only cure is the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. Verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Remember, Acts is a transition book. They're still trying to go to the Jewish people to preach Jesus Christ, to get them to accept Jesus Christ so they can bring in the millennial kingdom. At this point, they're not think, they're, you don't hear about the time of Jacob's trouble that much. Why? Because they think if they can get Israel to accept Jesus Christ as a whole then we can skip the time of Jacob's trouble and go straight to the millennial kingdom. Jesus will come back and rule and reign, and he's their king. That's why you have the sign gifts. That's why you have water baptism. Okay, a lot of signs, outward showing signs, because Jews require a sign. Repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins. And we are his witness of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. See, that's why we always say that's a big, I want to stop there. That's why we always say, Brother Says Christ, you see men, good, Bible-believing, God-fearing men in ministry that say, hey, what's people's attitude towards this book? Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. What's their attitude towards keeping God's word and living a life of Christ? God hath given them to, the, to that obey him. Remember it says that we're to obey the gospel? Okay. True salvation, true salvation has never been by works, but good works will follow true conversion. Okay? True heartfelt conversion comes from the heart. God saves you and says, okay, I'm in charge now, and you say, Lord, you're in charge now. Tell me what to do. And I do it. And when I fail you, I drop my cross. I deny myself. Drop your pride. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross that you dropped. The Bible talks about how we have to do it daily. And I'm talking to me. I have to do it daily and get back to following Jesus Christ. Okay? It's not about being sinless either. I wanted to throw that in there. But it talks about obeying Him. Our heartfelt desires. We want to serve you, Lord. We want to obey you. Tell me what to do, Lord. Show me the truth. And I will follow it. Verse 33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. They were cut to the what? <laughs> to the heart. Brothers and sisters of Christ, you're going to get two, two different reactions from people. Okay? When you preach in truth to them, it's going to cut to the heart. Either they're going to be convicted and they want what you have, and they understand that, yeah, I am sick, 
there's something wrong with this world. I'm on my way to hell. You know, they'll get saved. Or they're gonna they're gonna hate you. They get cut to the heart and they'll seek how they may do, destroy you. I mean, look at King James video ministries. So many times Brother Brian has cut people to the heart and they've sought how to destroy him. Um, out of all Bible-believing, God-fearing men on YouTube, he's the one that gets attacked the most. He does. They're all seeking how to destroy him. They're always going to YouTube and complaining and filing complaints again, filing complaints against him, trying to get all his videos flagged and everything. You know, he's even, from my understanding, he'll, he'll correct in the, if he ever watches this, he can correct it in the comment sections, but he's had police called on him. They're doing everything they can to destroy him. Why? Because he cut them to the heart with the word of God. Then stood up there one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. In other words, he's a man of reputation, so he stands up, they're going to listen to him. I just want to throw that part in there. God can use people. God can use a lot of people. Saved and lost for his purposes. Verse 35, And said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. He was slain and everybody just scattered. His uh, cult basically fell apart, became nothing. Verse 37, After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the day of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obey him, were dispersed. That's the problem with following. I just want to throw this in there. That's a problem, brother and sister Christ, when you have people who follow man, and that man is not Jesus Christ. We ought to obey man or God rather than man. That's what Paul said. Okay, we're going to obey Jesus Christ above and foremost. But I've even seen people that uh, I believe are saved, but they fall into the trap of the philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world, after the traditions of men, and not after Christ, they start falling away from this book and start falling into traditions of men. They start getting the praise of men. And the stands they once took, Peter Ruckman's the biggest example that I can think of off the top of my head. The stands he took and everything, everybody started, you have a lot of Peter Ruckman worshipers. They worship the man, Peter Ruckman, not the man he preached, Jesus Christ. They worship the man Peter Ruckman. And now that he's dead and buried and gone up to heaven, he knows better with all his mistakes. He's before the Lord. He's before the brethren right now. Look what's happened to his Babel building. They've turned their back on a lot of the beliefs that he believed in. Okay? It's come to naught. Because it became t solely on traditions of men. All right? Don't worship me. Don't worship Brother Brian, don't worship Brother JT, don't worship anybody but Jesus Christ. Okay? He's the final authority. His perfect written word is the final authority. Okay. Make sure you're doing your own Bible studies, not just following mine. You know, having your Bible open and following along with mine. But make sure you're doing your own Bible studies. I'm not, I'm not going to pray for you. Remember that statement I used to say? I'm still saying it. I can pray for you, but I can't pray for you. You say, well, what does that mean? When you have something, you need to take it to the Lord Jesus Christ first. You need to take it to Him first. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? Then when you've taken it to Jesus Christ, then you can ask me and I'll throw you in my prayers as well. Prayer is one-on-one -on -one with God. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not a big fan of this all. We all need to come together and repeat after me prayers and we all need to pray at the same time and you know, one person's praying and everybody's listening to him pray for them. I'm not a big keen on that. It's not in scripture, okay? Prayer is one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord, okay? You're supposed to be praying to God yourself. So I can pray for you after you've taken it to God yourself, 
but I can't pray for you. You don't come to me and say, I need you to put this in your prayers and you never take it to God yourself. You need to take it to God yourself. Okay? But these guys are perishing, and I've seen it with even people I believe are saved, but mainly with lost people. When lost people die, sex change. The sect, S-E-C-T, the sect changes. The cultism, you know, you have people that started uh, Jehovah's Witness, but now there's so many different branches of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, there's so many branches of Mormonism. You know, there's so many branches of this or that. It's just breaking out, and everybody's going their own way. Once the leader, the founder dies, everything just goes sideways. Okay. Ne they never hold true and strong like Bible-believing Christians have. True Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. Verse 38, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel be the, or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Let's happily be found even to fight against God. What were the, the uh, Pharisees doing when we read the Bible lift there? They were calling Jesus Satan. They're fighting against God. They're doing anything and everything they can, and they've gone so low as to do something that God won't forgive because Jesus is physically present, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. I read it for you too. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Even after they said, we're going to do it anyway, because we ought to obey God rather than men. They beat him again, told him not to do it. Look at the reaction, 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That's how we need to be, brothers and sisters of Christ. We need to keep standing and standing for absolute truth. These last days, I've seen a lot of people fall away. Either it's because sin came in, the lust of other things. We're in the middle of doing those studies and that series of salvation in this life as a Christian. Um, cares of this world come in, choke them out, and they fall away. They stop doing as much work for the Lord. Choke the word and it become unfruitful. Okay? Uh, uh, deceitfulness of riches, but sin comes in even sometimes, and their heart really hasn't changed on the stands, but they don't, they don't make the public stand. Why? Because they'd convict themselves, and they don't want to be convicted. They've fallen back in, they've fallen into temptation, they've chosen to sin, they're holding on to that sin, they don't want to let go of that sin, so they won't make a public stand of, I'm going to do what God says. And they start taking a lighter attitude towards sin. They start taking a lighter attitude towards the major doctrines. Well, you, I believe what the Bible teaches, but if you want to believe that, eh, it's okay. We can all come together what's going on there. They're falling away. Mm -hmm. But we need to have that stand. We need to worship the Lord and praise Him every time we make a stand. When someone calls me out on... on um, I've had brethren correct me on YouTube... But when you see someone come out there and just flat out call you Satan and servant of Satan and you're just preaching truth, they don't use scripture. Okay, they can't use scripture to do, refute you. So they'll resort to calling you names and putting you down. And they're not putting me down. They're putting Jesus Christ down. Okay. That's why Jesus, when he went after Paul, he said, why are you persecuting me? Not me, but Jesus saying, why are you persecuting me? Paul was persecuting people. The body of Christ, the church. But he's a lost man. Jesus is like, you're persecuting me. Why? They come up there and they start putting me down. And they start yelling at me and whatnot. Praise the Lord. And I'm counted worthy. I didn't have to go out of my way to get yelled at. You don't have to go out of your way to get yelled at. There's a lot of false converts out there that are going out in the world setting bad examples for Christians. And they get out there and they try to start fights. You don't have to do that. Just stand for the Word of God in your own life. Live a life of Christ. Preach absolute truth. And the fight will come to you. All right. Now, through this all, remember what it said, if this work be of men, it will come to naught. Now, one thing I wanted to point out that God really put on my heart, do you know what controlled opposition is? Uh, some people might know it, kind of have a basic idea and everything, okay? Best way I can say it is controlled opposition. Turn to Titus chapter 1, verse 16. 
This is controlled opposition, a good example of controlled opposition. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Controlled opposition, what's controlled opposition? You've got, let's say, I believe blue t-shirts are the best. Someone over here believes red t-shirts are the best. What's controlled opposition? You have one guy over here that's for the red t-shirts, you have one guy over here for the blue t-shirts. And you're controlling both of them and you're for the blue t-shirts. And you have the guy that's for the blue t-shirts, he's supposed to pretend like he's on your side. But he always throws little things in there. Well, the red, blue t-shirt is the best and everything, but eh, if you want to wear a red t-shirt, who cares? Well, you know, red t-shirts are kind of cool too, but you know, he always throws little things in there, but he's always acting like he's on your side, but he's always trying to nudge you over to the other side. Or he's always trying to make it out like this side, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and with shirts, it's not a big deal. But I'm talking about important stuff. So, but control opposition. You'll have people out there for Christians, you'll have people out there claiming to be Bible-believing, God-fearing Christians. And they're not. Okay. Galatians 2.4 And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with us. They came in. How'd they get in amongst us if, if, they, just, if they came in saying, hey, we want nothing to do with what you're saying and everything? They came in pretending to be one of us. They were working for Satan, but they come in and pretend like we're working for the Lord. We're one of you. They're controlled opposition. Acts 20, 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. Acts 24, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. How do they get in? Because they slowly sneak in. They say, I believe what you believe. I make the same stands you do. I live the same way you do. But over time, they slowly try to get people away from that and get to their side, Satan's side. Okay. Verse 30, Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. They start out with, when your face will say, I believe what you believe. Behind your back they say, well, I don't know about that. To other people. Why? To try to draw people away. Verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I always point that out, brother says Christ. He's saying with tears. It's almost as if God told him and showed him. I think he just because even in his day he could see it happening. If he could see how it's happening today, it'd probably be a river of tears. Brother says Christ, people are falling and dropping like flies. He, need, he ceased not to warn us night and day with tears. There's wolves in sheep's clothing out there. You're to judge them. You're to make sure to stand by this book and continue to live this book. And someone comes in with good words and fair speeches and tries to pull you away from this book. He knows people are going to fall for it. That's why he's not ceasing to warn you night and day with tears. You're going to have people coming in as control opposition. Hey, I'm on your side. I'm one of you. And they're a wolf with sheep's clothing on. 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You've got wolves in sheep's clothing, even men among you, perverse minds. They'll come in, just act like, they'll start out with, I believe everything you believe, all your stands, I'm the same way, I'm one of you. I'm one of you. And then over time, they start changing their stands here, there. They start causing problems. They start fighting. They start getting people to doubt the truth and to turn from it. Paul saw it happen in his day. He, was, he knows all things over time get worse and worse and worse with this world. 
it was just going to get worse. Turn to Philippians 3.16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same things. Brethren, you know, we're supposed to walk together, be of one mind. We're in one body. We're not separate bodies. We have different parts to one body, but we're one body. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so you have us for an example. Why? For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Their end is destruction. In other words, they're lost. They're heading for hell. But they claim to be Christians. Their God is their belly. That's what Satan offers them, the flesh. He offers them the world. They worship Satan. That's who their true God is. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. All women wearing pants, it's not that big of a deal if women wear pants. Who glory in their shame. Women wearing pants, you need to be ashamed of yourself. Any, any woman that stands there and says, I'm a Bible-believing, God-fearing woman, and vehemently, vehemently defends wearing pants, the apparel of men, when the Bible condemns it, not that, yeah, I still wear pants, I'm convicted by it, and I need to wear a dress. I'm talking about they, they just stand up, there's nothing wrong with me wearing pants, I can wear pants all I want. They should be ashamed, but they're glorying in their shame. That's a red flag to me. Verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, the blessed hope. We're talking about it right now, the judgment seat of Christ. We're always supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. He could come back any day. I need to make sure I'm earning rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm doing good things, good works, getting sin out of my life and living for Jesus Christ. Okay? We look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the life you live. Looking isn't just sitting there looking up at the clouds. I like cloud gazing, but that's not what this means. It means the life you're living. Are you living a life like Jesus could come back any moment? Or are you getting sidetracked and forgetting that Jesus Christ could come back in any moment and your eyes are taken off Jesus Christ? You're looking at the world and your, and your flesh and you're no longer looking for Jesus Christ to come back. Verse 21, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things unto himself. They were calling Jesus Satan. Okay? If Satan attacks Satan, how can he stand? But I always, but I want to really put in there, control opposition. You have people who will pretend to be on your side that aren't. They always have that attitude. You start hitting them hardcore with the Bible, God's Word. This is the foundation. You're not lining up with this book and you start hitting them. They'll come back with, whoa, calm down, whoa, calm down. I'm on your side. I'm on your... No, you're not. They try to use fair words and good speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. Okay? There's a lot of people who are newly saved, like I was. There was a time I was simple. Okay? I was blessed that... God protected me, and He'll protect you too if you're newly saved. But you've got to make sure this is the love you have for God's Word. Do you want to hide it in your heart, and you want to live it, and allow God to clean up your life, and start putting you on the right path? Okay? But they come back with, I'm, a, I'm on your side, I'm a Christian too. And what happens is, if you don't judge them according to this book to say, hey, are they truly a Christian, or are they controlled opposition? Wolves in sheep's clothing, false brethren. What happens? They'll lead you astray. Every time, they'll leave you astray. It's guaranteed to happen if you let them in. Um, a good example, I've said this story before, and then we'll end this study. I said this story before. There was a woman that was on King James Video Ministries. In the comments section, her name was Deborah Gill. And when we would talk in there, 
she would always say when Brian's salvation messages and everything that I'm a King James Bible believer, I'm a Christian, and I believe in the plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's what I believe. I'm one of you guys. And I would share scripture with her. We would do prayer requests back and forth. And the whole time I knew her, back then, this was like five, six years ago, back then, the whole time I knew her, she was pushing Robert Breaker, another man on YouTube. He, she kept pushing him. You've got to go over there. You've got to go over there. I never had time for it. Okay? I was newly saved, so I was still spending a lot of time playing video games in between my Bible studies. I had a love of the truth. I'd watch three or four hours worth of Bible studies every day through King James Video Ministries, sometimes through some other people, brethren, that I believe have fallen away, so I don't want to support them at this time, but there was a time when I would have. And I was really into that, and I didn't have time for it. Well, later on down the road, when everything came out and the truth came out, Robert Pranker taught a different gospel, a different plan of salvation. What was she doing on under King James Video Ministries supporting a man that taught a different plan of salvation than Brother Brian did out of the King James Bible? He used a King Robert Breaker uses a King James Bible, but he has a different gospel. And whether you believe Robert Breaker or whether you believe uh, Brother Brian, Brother Brian's right, I believe the scriptures. Brother Brian's right. The true plan of salvation. He's got the right Jesus Christ. He worships the right God. He's got the right plan of salvation. But even if you don't believe that, I always try to reason with some people which you just can't reason with. And I'm like, do you understand what she was? She was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Controlled opposition. She's over there on Brother Brian's channel claiming, yes, that's the right plan of salvation. And she was getting people to go to Robert Breaker. She was over there trying to get people to go over to Robert Breaker. And I heard from people that over on Robert Breaker, she was saying, no, Robert Breaker has the true plan of salvation. That's one of the things I really disagree with. Behind Brian's back, that I kind of disagree with it a little bit. What's going on there? When she's on Brian's channel, she lies like a dog. He's teaching absolute truth. But over on Robert Breaker's channel, well, he's kind of got some flaws. And he, he kind of makes, Brian makes mistakes here. And it, he really, how can you support two ministries that s preach two different Gospels? Even when I was not super newly saved, but a year after I was saved and did a lot of Bible study, even I knew you can't do that. The Bible talks about being lukewarm. He'd rather you be cold or hot. No neutral, no middle ground. Two different Gospels. What was she? Controlled opposition. She comes over to King James Video Ministries under the chat and tries to act like, I'm one of you guys. I'm one of you guys. Yes, the salvation he preaches is absolute truth. Oh, yes. Oh, by the way, you, you guys should really check out Robert Breaker. She was leading people astray. She was getting people to go over to a lost man's channel, a tr another wolf in sheep's clothing, so you can get messed up. And he has messed up a lot of people. And a lot of people have come out of that and said, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't listen to the brethren. He's fake. He's false. I'm sorry. And got really messed up. In my life, that's always going to be the best example of uh, when you see false Christians when it comes to controlled opposition. They're trying to act like they're on your side and they're for your stance, the same stance you take, the King James Bible. But in their head and in their heart, they're evil and wicked men and their whole goal is to try to get you to turn your back on them. And they'll point you over here. They'll point you over there. Anywhere to try to slowly get you away from the truth. Okay? They're working for Satan, but they claim to be Christians. It's just that simple. So that Bible if, I know we kind of went off a lot longer on that Bible if, but they're calling Jesus Satan. Why? Because they don't want his authority to be above their own. Okay? They're doing anything and everything they can to destroy him. Just like they're going to do to you. They hate you. You prick them to the heart. If you're truly a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, living a life of Christ, the life that you live 
and the words that you say are going to cut them to the heart. And they're going to do everything they can to destroy you. And one of the things that they're going to use is called controlled opposition. He, they're going to try to sneak people in. The, and they're going to try to claim to be Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. And their whole goal is to turn you against the Word of God. Turn you against the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. you got to stand, stand, stand. This is your foundation. Don't fall into the trap of the praise of other men. Loving the praise of men over the praise of God. Okay, I just, I've said this in other studies, I say it again. Paul warned night and day with tears. He knew people were going to get deceived and he knew people were going to fall away. He could preach truth to them every stinking day and you would still have people that would get deceived and go off to the left. They wouldn't stay to the path. And he never ceased to warn everybody night and day with tears. Right. It's just that simple, brothers and sisters of Christ. It is a fearful thing. That's why the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Talking about your life as a Christian. That fear and that trembling needs to be there every day. Am I living this, Lord? Every day. Not, well, I'll do it once a year. I'll take communion once a year or something. Every day, especially in these last days. Every day you need to be in this book and making sure that you're living a life of Christ with the life that you're living. That your home is a godly home. Bible-believing, God-fearing home. Every day it needs to be done. Don't become one of the ones that fall away. Don't be one of the ones that, uh, that, that faints, that falter. The Bible says don't faint, don't falter. Stand, stand, stand. Don't, don't be the ones that faint. Don't be the ones that falter. Don't be the ones that fall down and don't get back up. You can fall down as a Christian, but there's Christians that are falling down and they're not getting back up. Get back up. Deny yourself. Drop your pride. Fight the flesh through Jesus Christ and His perfect word. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You have to go through Jesus Christ. And He'll give you the strength to get back up. But today, no matter how, I've said it so many different ways. I don't know how many times I can say it, but there's still going to be people that fall away. I pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ almost every day now. Lord, help them. I'm struggling myself with temptation. Cares this world trying to come in and distract me. Um, sometimes, not much on the deceitfulness of, deceitfulness of riches, praise the Lord. No, no glory to myself, praise the Lord. But the lust of other things, temptation of sins, addictions and stuff that always try to come in. I'm really struggling in these last days. It seems like Satan is trying to throw everything at us to destroy us in these last days. You've got to be sober and be vigilant, the Bible says. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's devouring Christians. People are falling away and they're not getting back up. So hopefully this has struck home. I love these instruction righteousness with Bible ifs. And God's just shown us a lot. So thank you for watching. And please, please take this to heart. And make sure that you're evaluating yourself and you're living a life of Christ. Don't be a hypocrite. Judge yourself first before you judge anybody else. Saved or lost. Make sure you're judging yourself first. Okay? Make sure you're not being a hypocrite. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and thank you for your prayers. Please be praying for one another in these last days. Please, please, please. I'll see you in the next video.